All right. Hello, everyone. So cancer will soon overtake heart disease as the number one killer worldwide. Over 4,800 people a day get diagnosed with cancer in the United States alone. Last year, 9.6 million people died of cancer worldwide. Unfortunately, cancer is alive and well. And according to statistics, 50% of women born today and 33% of men born today will experience cancer sometime in their life. Hello, my name is Court Davies, and on November 30th, 2017, I was given just three years to live. I was diagnosed with a rare neuroendocrine tumor called malignant paraganglioma. It's the one in two million. Three years prior to that, I had been misdiagnosed by over 30 doctors. It took a small uh, hospital in rural Connecticut and an emergency room doctor to tell me to get what's called a 24-hour urine test. And what that urine test showed was that I had 100 times the adrenaline in my body that normal human beings do. And this is when they diagnosed this rare neuroendocrine tumor. Over the course of that time, I got a baseball-sized tumor taken out of my bladder, and three weeks later, I had a tumor taken off my back, followed by a two-inch screw in my hip uh, to fortify my hip to get rid of a tumor there, followed by smaller ablation surgeries, and then January of this year, just, what, seven months ago, uh, I wasn't able to sleep in a bed. I was sleeping in a chair, and as it turned out, uh, my spinal cord wasn't properly monitored, and what we found was that uh, my spinal cord was severely compressed at the T6 level. It was like as thin as a piece of paper. And they had to do an emergency surgery called a T6 corpectomy. That was new for me. I don't know if there's any doctors in the crowd. But they actually had to pull out my T6, the bone, and put a cage there in, uh, in, in, its, in its place. And I remember going into that surgery. The doctor looked at me and he said, there's no guarantee that you're going to walk after the surgery. You, know, you could have paralysis after this. And it was the scariest, absolutely scariest moment of my life. And so over the course of that time, I have been through uh, what I would like to call insurmountable amounts of stress. Chronic pain, inflammation, sleepless nights, ER visits, hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical bills, and on and on and on. And so that brings me to what I want to talk about, stress. And so the human body was designed to be able to handle stress in small spurts. And so we've all heard of the fight or flight mechanism that we have in our body. Uh, our ancestors, when they were chased by saber-toothed tigers, all the, uh, all the, what the body did is the body mobilized itself and sent all its blood and its hormones out to the appendages. And what that did is it allowed us to fight or flee. And what would happen afterwards is our body would go into homeostasis. And that homeostasis would allow us to rest and repair. But the challenge with society in general right now, we're not even talking about cancer, but the challenge with society in general is that that gas pedal is continuously down and we're all suffering from chronic stress. Chronic stress, as it turns out, is responsible for almost all the ailments and diseases that's, that's in our society today. Almost everything stress is responsible for. And so imagine what cancer patients go through. A lot of you can't imagine it because you've never experienced it, but I'm sure people in this room have been closely related to someone that's had cancer because it's touched so many people. And so as a cancer patient, my gas pedal has been to the floor. I have been dealing with this chronic stress. And what I said to myself is that, okay, modern medicine is making headway. Uh, cancer patients are living longer. There are a lot more remissions. But is there something correlated between stress and cancer? And as it, turned out, as it turns out, there is. Cancer actually can be sped up by the stress hormones in our body. And that's really what I want to talk about today. It's super significant. This is a picture of me last Friday. 
And the reason I put this in here, this is, this is interesting because it was kind of a last minute addition. But for those of you that can't see it, it's a picture of me in an infusion chair in uh, US, UCSD in, in Southern California. And so we finally got to the point where I got uh, approved for a experimental drug because my, the cancer that's in my body is so very rare. And so I'm driving to the hospital and I'm very nervous because of the side effects. You know, I don't know, what, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what the next day is gonna be like. I had so much tension and stress in me already. And so I'm driving to the hospital and as I pull up to the hospital, they call me, the hospital calls me and says, hey, your insurance company isn't gonna cover your treatment so we can't treat you right now. And so there's me with all this amazing hope driving to the hospital, but nerves going, man, we're finally gonna turn things around. We're finally gonna reverse it. And I drive up to the hospital and they say, nope, not for you. And so as you could imagine, this create, I mean, I could actually feel the, the, the stress hormones in my body right now. And I'm sure you guys can feel it in your body too because it's so real. So as it turns out, luckily this all worked out. I only had to wait six hours to get it fi figured out at the hospital. But that's, you know, that's kind of the way our medical system works. And so it was a back and forth between my doctor and insurance company and doctor and pharmaceutical company. And, but the stress is insane. And so I am going into getting this life-saving potential infusion, and you know they're yanking me around. And I'm gonna tell you right now that statistics and data show that if you're calm going into your infusion, if you're calm going into being treated, that medicine works better. So they were actually making me more nervous, creating those stress hormones, and making it harder for me to heal. So, Imagine if cancer patients, when they were diagnosed, had some kind of facilitator to answer these tough questions, to be there from a stress perspective. Imagine what that would mean. You know, there's your doctors, there's your nurses, and you know, I, I, I want to I preface the fact that over the course of the almost two years that I've, you know, been dealing with this, not one doctor has asked me how I felt how I was doing mentally, right? What if we were better? What if we got to the point where we recognize that this stress aspect is just as big of a component as treating the cancer itself? And so this gets me into a fun topic, sociogenomics, okay? It's a fun word. And so there's a gentleman by the name of Stephen Cole. He's a PhD at UCLA, and he's a pioneer of sociogenomics. Sociogenomics is simply the study of what chronic stress does to the genome, okay? And so, simply put, what he does is he studies how isolation, stress, bills, how all that affects our genetic disposition. And it's really interesting stuff. And so, here's our cute little mice. And this is the first experiment that they've done uh, from a cancer perspective. And what they did is they injected mice with tumors. I know that's really difficult to hear. But testing on mice, you know, makes leaps for mankind. And so what they wanted to figure out is that if they put the, mouse, put the mice, the mouse and the mice, in different stressful situations, how would it affect the cancer? So on the left side here, the mouse, he's, he, him or her, by a are by themselves. M mice, I didn't know this, are actually very social creatures. And so when a mouse is by itself, it's actually under a lot of stress. And so what they found out was the cancer grew faster. And on the right, when the mice were put into positions where they were too packed in, where there was too many people, too many people, too many mice in their cage, <laughs> thinking from a personal perspective, the cancer also grew faster. Okay, but on the flip side of things, when the mice were caressed and they were pet, even by humans, the cancer actually slowed down. And so uh, Dr. Cole has some amazing studies, some amazing research. In fact, you know, I was beginning to question myself when I was doing the research because I was like, is, is the correlation that obvious? And you know, I asked Dr. Cole straight out, 
you know, I had a phone call with him before this talk, and I said two things. I said, can human beings change their gene expression? Can we influence it? And can we slow down cancer? And he said emphatically yes to both things. And so women who, under, who are under high levels of chronic stress and have low social support are attributed to a nine-fold increase in breast cancer. Think about that. Here's some really, really cool studies, and these actually aren't cancer-related. So Ohio State did a study, and what they found out was that wounds of stressed-out people healed 40% slower than those of people that were calmer. There's another study out of the uh, AIDS Institute, the UCLA AIDS Institute, and what they found out was that HIV-positive people that were stressed out, their diseases progressed two to three times as fast as those that weren't stressed. And on the other side of it, those that weren't stressed, the antiviral drugs worked four times as good. Four times as good. So what we're seeing here is that less stress equals less pain equals slower disease progression equals medicine working better equals us getting better quicker. And so here's, to me, the most exciting of all the studies. So meditation has been something that's changed my life. And this is not about meditation, my talk. Uh, but meditation has been the thing that has helped alleviate the stress in my life. I meditate probably two to three times a day. And so Mass General Hospital has an institute called the Benson Henry Institute. And so what they did was something really cool. They took 20 people and they introduced them to meditation. And they took their gene expression, okay, in the beginning. And over eight weeks, they taught these novices. None of them had meditated before. They taught them how to meditate. And at the end of eight weeks, what they found was that just eight weeks of meditation changed over 1,500 genes in the human body. 1,500 genes were affected by meditation. And what that means is that there is gene upregulation and downregulation. What that means is genes are essentially turned on and turned off. And so what they found out were 800 genes associated were health from, with health were turned on. And 600 genes associated with stress were turned off. So think about how powerful that is. Think about how powerful that would be to incorporate into modern medicine. You know, we have the ability to change our gene expression in as little as eight weeks. And I'm sure the gene expressions were changed much, much quicker than that. And so how can we create change? So I envision a world where a cancer patient comes in. And, you know, my doctor sat me down and said, Mr. Davies, you have a very serious disease. You have three years to live. See you later. Here, take this. Go home. Right? That's how it was. I remember, you know, I remember sitting there and I remember my father next to me and, you know, he sunk down into his chair and I'm not even sure if he heard the prognosis because we just were all in, in shock. And so what if I was taken into another room after that and sat down with a care facilitator and they said, hey, you just... You know, you just absorbed a lot of information, you know. Here's someone that has been through what you've been through. Talk to them. Here's some questions that, you know, I can answer for you. You know, what would that mean? And so on the surface level, it seems very soft, but we know that it, from, from, from a genetic and scientific level that it affects us. It can actually help us heal. So when you get a prognosis like cancer, it actually gets saved in your body. Your body actually saves it for later, and the reason it does that is because it knows it when it triggers emotion and pain. And so that prognosis stays with you. And so imagine the second you got that prognosis, you can actually kind of stoke, put, put out the fire a little bit, you know, cool it down. And imagine what it would mean to actually continue to talk to these people. And so there actually is some community, you know, upswell of this, some nonprofit organizations doing this. It's a, small, it's a small outreach, but they're making really great headway. And so I have a friend, her name's Tanya, and I know this is a lot, and I'll read it to you. She had breast cancer, 
And so she actually had support like this. And she said, this type of support was a game changer for me. I had lost a sister to cancer and had breast cancer in my extended family, losing two family members. So that augmented my fear and anxiety. The person the nonprofit organization provided with me helped me know what to expect at different parts of my journey with compassion, deep understanding, empathy, and patience. She also asked me questions to help me know what I should be asking, when to ask, who to ask, and why to ask. This included topics well outside the purely medical, my legal rights as they pertained to insurance and financial coverage for treatments, then and well into the future. Seems so obvious, doesn't it? Why doesn't this exist for everyone? This not only made her feel better, but it probably changed her gene expression. It probably changed the whole destiny of her disease. And so modern medicine is notoriously slow. And so uh, some associates, some partners and I have decided to do something about it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a foundation. And that foundation is going to connect cancer patients that have gotten through it those stage two, stage three, stage four patients that really had it difficult and connect them with people that are newly diagnosed. We are going to actually create retreats both online and around the world. And we're going to take those cancer patients out of their stressful situations and we're going to help them change their lives. And we're going to put them back into their lives, a new person. And it's going to help medicine work better it's going to help them feel better. It's going to help the stress that they get from their families and friends. And then what we're going to do is the foundation is going to be focused on the people that don't have the resources to access these things. And so, you know, it's not just for those that have the financial resources. This needs to be for every single person who has cancer. So here's a picture of me smiling. So the name of my talk was The Missing Link in Evolving Cancer Care. So I believe the missing link is this. I believe there's, you know, your treatments, your modern medicine, you know, your diet may be involved, but stress management is such a huge part of this. And if we can get to the point where we manage the stress of cancer patients, we can make them happier, we can... Uh, have them experience less pain. We can make medicine work better. And we can heal more people. We can extend lives. And what that's going to mean is a lot more fulfilling futures for these cancer patients. Thank you. <laughs>